Hello and welcome to a fully charged news update. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but it does feel like the world is beginning to wake up again after the, the sort of whatever it is, three month lockdown. It used to be drive everywhere, fly everywhere, burn fossil fuels at staggering rates. That was just normal. But then we stopped doing all of that and everybody noticed that the world was kind of different. And everything we do and everything we know about has been affected and not least the energy and transport industry, which is what Fully Charged focuses on. Now, I took part in a panel discussion the other day, a Zoom one from here, I never go anywhere else. And uh, uh, I used the term existential crisis to describe the current state of the automotive manufacturing industry. And afterwards, I felt a bit stupid. I went, That's a, that was a bit overdramatic. It was a bit theatrical, darling. It was a bit unnecessary to go that far. Then I heard about what was going on at Volkswagen. For the past couple of years, VW, who employs 660,000 people around the world, was one of the really great hopes for an established car maker to transition to making just electric cars from now on. Now, as some of you will know, I drove the very early version of the Volkswagen ID3 a couple of years ago. Uh, I know I tend to wax lyrical about any electric car, but seriously, is a 21st century machine. But the pressures of the COVID-19 lockdown, the politics, the government involvement, the unions, the bullish management uh, at, at Volkswagen, the sort of swaggering stuff that I don't really understand about with big corporations, it's all come to a bit of a head. So VW have been wrangling and arguing and fighting with each other and splitting off into little splinter groups that everyone hates him and then they all love them and then she's awful and he's brilliant and then they're all, it's just gone on and on. What could really be described quite adequately as an existential crisis. So with all these shenanigans going on, the CEO of the Volkswagen Group, the boss of bosses, like the big dude, uh, Herbert Diess, he seems to have lost a little bit of control. He's been seen as the voice and the leading light in the electrification of what Volkswagen manufacture. But recently they have had some really serious problems with the software that operates the ID3. Not the car, they've made tens of thousands of the cars already, but the software is being a bit of a problem and they're having to sort that out and everyone's blaming everyone else for why the software doesn't work. And now they're saying they're going to make all sorts of drivetrains for all sorts of cars, which is automotive manufacturing code for shut up and buy a diesel. As many observers of the industry have said, uh, the great hope was that Volkswagen would become the number two electric car maker after Tesla. And a recently leaked quote from the Tesla CEO revealed some of their thinking. He said, in China, our market leadership is not a law of nature. In China, the leader in electric cars is now called Tesla. It will be years before we have reached the necessary level of expertise in software to be able to compete at the forefront. Even today, hardly a line of software code comes from us. In that statement, you can really see the dilemma because an electric car is just a battery on wheels. The hardware is relatively simple. I mean, over the last hundred years, we've really perfected things like steering, uh, brakes, drivetrains, uh, suspension. All that stuff is universal to all cars, regardless of what makes them go. What makes electric cars really different is the fact that it's a software-based technology. It's a battery, it's a motor, and everything else that goes on in that car is code. It's software that controls the car. It's software that can be updated during the car's life to change its characteristics. Now we've just seen this with Tesla. They have just updated the software in their longest range car, the uh, Model S 100D. Uh, they have managed to, just with software, no other changes to the vehicle, same size battery, they've managed to increase the range from just over 300 miles to just over 400. By tweaking the software, making it more energy efficient, making the way the vehicle moves more energy efficient reducing the power to the motor at, the, at critical times as it's going along the road. Really clever software stuff. At my generation, don't understand all that stuff. We don't know what people do, young people do, when they go tippy 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 tap 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 really fast on a laptop. We understand crankshafts, flywheels, pistons, camshafts, timing chains, gearboxes, clutches, transmission systems, limited slip differentials if you want to get really flash and modern, exhaust pipes, fuel tanks, fuel pumps, 
fuel filters, oil filters, oil sumps. That's what we understand, old fashioned steam age technology. We don't get software. Okay, there's some people my age who do, and they're all very rich, but numpties like me haven't really got a clue. So now I think I was right uh, to describe the crisis that automotive, the automotive industry is going through as an existential one. I don't think it was over dramatic and theatrical. Okay, enough about that. Now, fracking. Oh, the joy. Now, we all know that fracking in the United States literally changed the global energy picture by pumping toxic filth underground at incredible pressure and cracking the rocks that thousands of feet under the surface, they managed to extract huge amounts of oil and gas. I'm not gonna say natural gas, I'm just gonna say gas. Out of the ground, which has really changed the energy picture. It stopped uh, America being so dependent on importing oil from outside regimes. You know, it, there's been a lot of benefits. Okay, yeah, they poisoned the water table and they caused a few earthquakes and they, you know, a lot of cattle just dropped in and flames coming out of people's taps. All that is overdramatic. That's like saying existential crisis. But what really happened was a load of fly-by-night two-bit companies started fracking like mad, made some money rather quickly. That dries up very, very, very fast because the, the wells don't last that long. You know, you've got to keep cracking more and more rock, you've got to spread sideways. They drill down and then they drill sideways. Brilliant technology, it doesn't last that long. It worked for America for a, for a short period of time. In a couple of years time, they won't be able to get any more oil and then they'll be back where they started, importing those from places like Saudi Arabia. So for a while, it looked like the UK government were gonna follow this utterly deranged, super ultra short-sighted trajectory here in the UK. Uh, but in an interview with the BBC, the UK energy minister, Kwesi Kwarteng, stated, and I quote here, we had a moratorium on fracking last year and frankly, the debates moved on. It is not something that we're looking to do. We've always said we'd be evidence backed. So if there was a time when the science evidence changed our minds, we would be open to that. But for now, fracking is over. Now, earlier on, I did mention earthquakes in a slightly flippant way, but that is why we had a moratorium in this country. At the UK's single fracking site at Preston Euro, just outside Blackpool, uh, all work had to stop because an earthquake measuring 2.9 on the Richter scale took place. Now, no one died, but thousands of people felt it. It was quite a major event in the UK because we don't get that many earthquakes here. It's not that we never get them. I felt one in this house. So after all that fuss, after all the millions spent arguing about it, all the demonstrations, the, where the test drilling sites, the fact that you know, it was the most regulated industry in the world. We were constantly being reassured how safe it was to pump incredibly toxic materials that we weren't allowed to know what was in them, pump them underground at phenomenal pressures to release a little bit of gas that would last 10, 15 short-term years, very, very blinkered and short-term was never gonna, but the people who were gonna do it were gonna make a load of money for a very short time, and that's all that matters. Shut up, don't ask questions, shareholders come first. Forget it if you live near a fracking site, you poor sop. All that stuff was normal, and then they've just given up, they are gone, oh yeah, fracking doesn't really work here, let's move on. Here's the really important thing. The reason the energy minister in the, from the UK government was talking to a television station was because he was announcing the introduction, <laughs> this is fantastic, this is so, so incredibly symbolic. Uh, he was talking about a rather more uh, positive uh, energy story. Carlton Highview Power have just secured a 10 million pound government grant to build the world's largest liquid air battery. Liquid air? What the what? Liquid air, okay, liquid air. I've seen a liquid air battery. They are like amazing. Quite a big industrial unit. What happens is when there's an oversupply of electricity, you use that electricity to, to chill down really a lot and compress air and you pump it in, it becomes liquid and you pump it into tanks. Liquid air, super cold, super, super condensed air. And then I'm talking air, nothing special. Literally what we breathe, air. So they, they compress it down, they store it in massive tanks. That is what happens. And then when you need electricity, you release that air through a, a valve, incredible high pressure, you can't even imagine it, that drives a turbine, that spins a generator, that generates electricity. It's a fairly simple system with some fairly chunky industrial support. 
And what is impressive is this system can deliver 50 megawatts of electricity to the grid in a matter of seconds. The liquid air battery will be installed in the Greater Manchester area and can store 250 megawatt hours of electricity. Now to put that into some kind of perspective, some of you will know and I've already mentioned the very large Tesla power pack battery installation in South Australia that is connected to a wind farm that has already played a major role in stabilising the Australian grid, even though the government who love coal don't want to talk about it, it really has made a big impact. That is 129 megawatt hours. This is 250 megawatt hours. So this will be the world's first commercial uh, liquid air energy storage system. Uh, once, obviously, once the air is compressed and stored in the tanks, it could be uh, left there for a long time. Um, and this, this system is able to power 200,000 homes, which is a really weird way of measuring things, but 200,000 homes for five hours. Not that you'd ever use it like that. You'll use it to balance the grid, but that's, you know, the, the PR shizzle is that it's 200,000 homes for five hours. That's pretty good. Now, let's quickly discuss China and electric buses. Now, our first two episodes uh, from our Shanghai correspondent, Elliot Richards, have gone down very well. They've been very popular, but we have noticed quite a lot of you know, completely valid criticism of the uh, current political regime in China and some like absent, actual kind of nasty hostility about China and how people would never buy any product that was made in China. We can't completely disassociate ourselves. Whoever's making these comments is using a, a device which in whole or part will have been manufactured in China because since the 1980s all the clever corporations particularly in America all the high-tech people all the manufacturing people from all over Europe have been offshoring what a good way of saying it offshoring their manufacturing to Southeast Asia to China to uh, Vietnam to Cambodia to you know Thailand all those places let's offshore because we don't have to pay the people who work there quite as much money as we do here Oh, that's brilliant. So you end up with one or two incredibly wealthy people, you know, the people who run places like Apple, Nike, Google, you know, anyone who manufactures anything, they make it in China because it's cheaper and we buy it because it's cheaper. So we're not, none of us are innocent of supporting and helping the Chinese regime. So that side of the argument is a little bit flaky. So maybe one solution is what we need to do is make stuff in our countries that is as good or better than what they make in China. Which is why I'm very excited about a company called Arrival. They're a British manufacturing company that make electric buses and delivery vans. So we're trying to see their design and production facility as soon as we can. But in the meantime, they have just launched their first electric bus. Now at the moment, you can see electric buses on the roads, particularly in the UK. There's quite a few cities that have quite a few electric buses. Mostly, they're made in China. If they're not made in China, they're using uh, components uh, and batteries and drivetrain systems that are made in China. Arrival are making pretty much the whole thing, probably not the batteries, but everything else they're manufacturing themselves. But one of the clever ideas they've had is not to have one massive gigafactory that produces tens of thousands of electric buses and delivery vans, but a distributed network of micro factories that employ people in a local area, that make vehicles that are suitable to that area, but using a, a system of uh, a shared component parts for that. Really clever stuff. Uh, Arrival is currently producing 10,000 electric vans for UPS in the UK. Uh, and I can't wait to go and see what they're up to because it is actually really exciting and there's some amazing people working there. And finally, uh, regular viewers will know I've got a bit of a thing about electric aircraft. Well, now I know there are some electric aircraft already in service in the USA, but a little known organization called NASA uh, has been quietly beavering away making a very interesting aircraft. Now this aircraft, they're not gonna start, NASA are not gonna start manufacturing electric planes. What they're doing is finding designs and systems for electric planes that they can then share with the wider uh, aeronautical engineering community because their understanding and knowledge and scientific uh, excellence can really show that how this technology can work best. So their 100% electric plane is based on the Technam P260. Oh, what the P260, beautiful plane, which is an Italian four-seater twin-engine uh, light aircraft. So that would normally have on the wings, you know, two engines. Well, they've completely changed all that. They've used the fuselage, which is the bit you go in. I know all about planes. 
Uh, and the old combustion power units have been replaced with much smaller, uh, with a much, much smaller wing. That's what freaks me out. The wing is like two sticks and, and two 60 kilowatt electric motors either end with propellers. All the way along the wing are 12 much smaller electric motors with little fans on them. That's just for it to take off. Once it's up in the air, they all stop spinning. They all fold themselves back into the wing so that there's, they're more, there's less drag, it's more efficient. Uh, and that is the really key thing about this plane. The design is as much about efficiency as it is about zero emissions. And the skinny wing is, according to the NASA engineers, 58% uh, smaller. It's 58% uh, smaller, which results in, and this is a pretty crucial metric, a 500% increase in energy efficiency. That is the really important thing. It's not just about how we generate uh, 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 energy and how we, uh, how we use renewables to generate energy. It's about using that energy in the most efficient way possible. That is what is really exciting about the technology we're seeing develop all around us. That is all I've got time for. Uh, please do carry on watching Fully Charged. We've got some brilliant shows coming up. Just to say, you know, we're still struggling on against all the odds and we couldn't struggle on against all the odds without the help of a few of our amazing patrons. And I just want to thank some of them now. These are wonderful patrons who donate $10 a month or more to keep Fully Charged on your screens. And they are Alexander Wood, Tom DiGiovanni, Lawrence Lee, Rick Mason, Valentine Kaufman, Joachim Rother, Peter Downs, Susie Evans Frank, Ulf Stjorsted, Stu's Outdoor Adventure, Bruno Fable, Becca Chicken Kelly, David Weiss, Edward Abel, Erling Brandvik, Robin Tanner, Andrew Holmes, Logical Chimp, Yoav Levy, and Lee Bennett. Thank you so much for your support. Absolutely critically important. Uh, I'm not going to go on anymore. Uh, please do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a look at the Patreon link, but no pressure. It's up to you. With the YouTube membership is getting more and more interesting. We're starting to learn how to develop that with some exciting news coming up soon about the, the live shows and the electric drive-in cinema. I cannot believe it, but it looks like it's going to work. So that is all, as always, if you have been. Thank you for watching.